Perfecto. Yeah, we are ready. Yeah. Good evening, all, and uh, welcome to the second lecture in the series of In Tune with Nature at the uh, School of Environmental Design and Architecture at Nabrashna University. Uh, today, our guest is architect Uday Andhare, uh, an alumna of uh, SEPT University, Ahmedabad, and he has uh, tremendous uh, experience in his practice where he steers his studio with a belief in a technically appropriate and ecologically sensitive approach that weaves together threads of traditional wisdom into design. They use passive solar technologies in tune with uh, cultural aspects and they try to connect with the landscapes and he's particularly fond of organic farming. So he tries to integrate a lot of it into his projects. And he has a, a vast range of projects, right from interior design projects to landscape projects. And um, without much delay, I would hand off the mic. Just a note to all the students out there on YouTube Live, please feel free and we encourage you to uh, put in your questions, type in your questions on the YouTube uh, stream so that uh, we can ask them on your behalf to Mr. Uday. And uh, we'd like to have it as, uh, you know, interactive as possible. So Uday, over to you. Thank you, Neil. A very good evening to you all. I'm thankful to Seda and also to Nea Servate for this invite to be able to come uh, appear here and share what we've been up to for the past few years. Uh, the theme of this lecture series, In Tune with Nature, raises pertinent questions for us all questioning our relationship with nature, which is often seen as a binary. If we believe that we are truly an intrinsic part of nature, then what is the language we must learn to speak so that our dialogue with our environment becomes clear and thoughtful. These are some of the questions that we have been all looking at. We also uh, question how we compare the one act, the one time act of building versus sustained cyclical engagements to repair, upgrade and heal existing resources. Is it possible to create a supportive resilient layer around our work that is entrusted to nature and its order without an overarching dependence on technology. As practitioners, we are aware of our shortcomings and also as a profession and do realize that attempting to be sustainable must go beyond mere damage control. I believe that design must address resilience, economy of resource and thermal comfort as its underpinning. Respecting skilled human resources by widely embracing intensive labor and craft practices is even more pertinent in our context. It is essential for us to engage with our context, recognizing that there exist invisible connections with empathy and resolve with nature as a medium to heal. I'd like to uh, share the screen at this moment and we can Our exposure to a certain grounding we received as students of architecture instilled a rigor of thought that was always paired with the process of acting upon an idea. It was not important as much to arrive at a solution at the outset, but the journey which defined the imminent outcome, allowing the mind to dwell. The lag between process and outcome was cherished the outcome celebrated while at the same time relegated to a work in progress, a never ending process. To us, building construction was an important um, part of education. Building construction was taught and understood in ways that helped reinforce design possibility through the understanding of best practices 
and analyzing building failures. As students, we learned what not to do, and that has helped us immensely in our work, for which I am thankful. Academic interactions later with students and peers through teaching continues to contribute to my thought. I deeply admire the work of fellow architects and engineers today who passionately engage with new alternatives using earth innovative masonry techniques, use of bamboo and efficient systems that explore potential of steel, developing an amazing body of shared open knowledge amongst us. Ahmedabad was the place where we grew up, studied and now practice. It has been a fertile ground for interdisciplinary engagements fostered by its many institutions where musicians, bards, storytellers and many trespassers shared a common stage. This amalgam was essential and helped our abilities to make lateral connections across disciplines, enriching the process of learning. Our parallel interest in the music and food of our country, its diversity of built habitat, language, musicality, cultivation, cooking, and handling available resources continues to be an important learning to draw from. I celebrate values that unite us as people and make us an integral part of nature. Some important influences came our way, shaping our view of natural systems and society. Mansana Bo Fukuoka's book, One Straw Revolution, talks of the concept of minimally invasive farming methods and opened our eyes to new dimensions of a passive engagement with nature. The idea of do nothing farming puts the notion of time for nature to heal and replenish in a new light. Rain-fed farming in Ramnagar, Rajasthan is one such living example of systems that exist today and continue to flourish. Anupam Mishra and his seminal works, Aaj Bhi Kare Hai Talab, and Rajasthan Ki Rajat Bunde continue to guide and reinforce our faith in water and its relevance to what we attempt to do today. He talked of the idea of Aadhaar, Samaj, and Samaj, meaning support systems, deep understanding, and society, which remain a vital learning for us. The works and writings of his proteges in the field continues to be an inspiration for us. I realized that deeper knowledge of water and its structures could not be understood without understanding our physical context, society, materiality, and the craft of building. The idea of conservation of water through its ingenious methods seen in kunds, valves, cisterns, and wells was essential. Our interest in the study of stone and lime in construction exposes to life uh, practices of lime in contemporary construction for its incredible affordability and resilience. In this, we see live practices seen in Kumbalgad with water, conservation, the idea of uh, perennial lakes which exist today just because the community supports such endeavors. And of course, structures that, have, that are iconic and continue to inform our present day uh, knowledge about water. There exists a huge resource of master craftspersons in our own land from whom we all must learn and grow. As if by providence, we met several masters of their own crafts over time in our quest to learn. This is the master lime mason Nizamuddinji from Bikhanil, who was instrumental in educating us to realize our first few projects in lime done in Ahmedabad and later on in Kutch. Subsequent travels to the zones of Nagaur and Chekhavati gave us first-hand exposure to nuances of the use of this material. Its breathability makes it a living membrane that connects the structure with a natural order of exchange, enhancing the quality of the environment within, self-healing the surface 
and ensuring durability. It's forgiving nature during construction is a virtue that affords time to be creative. We discovered small privately owned, owned lime quarries and kilns that have survived the onslaught of cement companies and continue to provide an alternative to the locals over cement. The practice of hot lime mortars and plasters being used today are an absolute delight and we have been able to tap into these resources directly to support the use of lime in cities. Living examples of restoration and preservation seen in Shekhawati also allude to the fact that these practices are alive. Recycled surki and lime bricks coupled with hot lime mortars and plasters have proved to be an excellent combination for load bearing and confined masonry systems that we deploy at various scales of building. Skilled craftspersons are employed in projects on some of our projects to train teams of local masons who have never worked with lime before to a great success. A big part of our role has also been to facilitate this exchange, marrying appropriate materials and construction techniques with available practices. The photograph on screen right now is from a recently completed project where we used uh, masons who construct uh, rainwater tanks in farmlands in Saurashtra and worked with them to create an engineered um, thermal mass underground water tank which was used in radiant cooling. Vernacular traditions embed best practices to use minimal resources to build. We have learned this from local masons like Karubai Sosa, who's seen working in this photograph, who comes from the Lokmitra Sanstha in Saurashtra, and another gentleman, Jayanti Bhai Prajapati in Ahmedabad, who builds very economical masonry tanks for local use. These methods have now been mainstreamed into our work with critical engineering inputs to develop a model for structure cooling and rainwater consumption simultaneously. These are examples of how clusters of tanks can be networked together. Uh, these are about 25,000 liter capacity each and they get networked together and buried below the ground to provide adequate resource for water. Simple masonry work very beautifully and elegantly executed. These are some of the studies and drawings from some recent uh, projects which are in the design stage, which talk about various methods of creating reservoirs and draw wells using brick masonry and lime. Uh, some of these examples are executed examples. The last one, which is the more complex one, is in the design stage and possibly uh, may be used in one of the projects. To us, objects of joy and beauty such as traditional agri implements are a great resource to understand dependencies within societies. We discovered this pitchfork, which is known as Jai, which is a simple locally made timber pitchfork made in a village called Butati near Nagaur in Rajasthan. Its making involves the use of care wood twigs cut and bent by heat shaping it to a curvature and assembled. It uses animal skin parchment and gut to hold its fork to the staff, as you can see over here. Twig harvesters, carpenters, and leather craftsmen work together to make this lovely object of enduring utility. The object travels from one space in the village to the other, from the carpenter's yard to the leather worker, and back and forth until it is finished. The finished tool comes back into the space where it started and sold. We witness this process and the experience is the kind of learning that make us, makes us feel enriched and also weak in the knees at the same time. Its making embodies synergistic interdependence within crafts and communities, which is slowly being lost. We discover examples of innovation, reuse and frugality everywhere, like the improvised use of a fan grill embedded as a ventilation device in a mud wall and a rooftop vent clumsily supported 
by used bottles. As Aravena puts it beautifully, scarcity of resources becomes a filter to arbitrariness in design and strikes a universal chord. To us, the everyday is important. This is our home on the outskirts of Ahmedabad, where we've been living since the last 17 years. Our home was built soon after the earthquake of 2001, and it has been our lab of sorts examining our relationship with nature and evolving continuously. The garden where we grow much of our food, make compost, harvest rainwater to drink, conserve and recycle seeds we save and share and the food we cook, virtually living outdoors, forms the core of many lived experiences and practice. That's the glimpse of how the plan is with the kitchen garden on one side, the internal garden court and the house spread across the garden. Edible screens of papri, a beanstalk and other vines are used to shade and transform space. That's the water systems. And also an engagement of the building elements and the landscape allowing for one to take over the other. To the left is a simple um, channel that draws rainwater from the roof and uh, uh, goes to the harvesting system but that's operational only for two months in a year. And then this channel gets occupied by pigeons and birds, they nest in there, the bogan takes over, and it's only for those two months that we need to have that channel clean. After that, it belongs to somebody else. So these are the uh, uh, sort of adjustments that we work with uh, through our house. The house basically has no living space. This is the main space which engages with the outside. More recently, during the part of the lockdown, we were solely dependent for vegetables from our garden to gratifyingly realize that we had produced enough, not only for ourselves, but for our immediate neighbors. I'll just skip back a bit. This is the screen, the edible screen outside our bedroom, which is facing the south. It's been providing us beans for the last one and a half years and becomes a fantastic device that filters light into our rooms. And I think this is what we really uh, enjoy about uh, allowing ourselves to become part of nature and Somewhere down the line, it starts sort of connects uh, us to a different realm of experience. This is our rooftop uh, and what we do with it in summer. We buy hay from the local farmers, dump it on the roof and insulate our roof throughout the summer. And this is given back to our milkman once the hay has uh, become less and they can use it just before the monsoon. These are the vegetables we harvest and share with our neighborhood. And of course, the realm of the outside, which is a space where reptiles and snakes and frogs and birds and others come and go and make it their own. So this is a permanent nesting ground now for a lot of water hens and kingfishers and other birds. And it is not too far away from where we have it. So, uh, this is the kind of experience that we would we cherish and we try to bring into our work wherever possible. Reflecting upon the current times, we feel that our choices must be sensible to address the common larger good through shared knowledge and collaborations. The small can effectively become big, embed big ideas. Many small ideas could join the dots to define lasting sustained progress in the right direction, quite akin to puddles of water that collect and connect to form a lake. It is a belief that meaningful work will find these puddles and we strive to become one of those puddles. 
that's how the everyday filters into our work and being. This slide, um, we look at issues of context, history, precedent, place, ecology, native genius, societal beliefs, frugality, and adherence to a process intensive approach <coughs> in our work. <coughs> Architecture, in our opinion, has to be situated in its context so as to act with a firm sense of rootedness and address its times. Time, in this view, is also context specific. We have worked mostly in Western India, dealing with its harsh and arid landscape. During the course of our work, we have defined some broad tenets that have shaped our practice. The client and programmatic needs, the site, available resources, water, thermal comfort, and building resilience. <clears throat> Certain architectural principles at work, which we have learned as students and continue to kind of recall as practitioners in many ways, look at architectural layering, aspects of porosity, honest conveyable material choices, seeking design anchors when we progress with our work to validate program and embed ideas and meaning into the program to seek an expression. I think that uh, is a very important component of our practice where an expressive architecture can emerge when there is an intensively researched idea behind what one wants to do. And so it is not a, a layer that is kind of slammed onto the building, but something that grows from within the intent. And to aid that, we have the whole uh, compelling notion that buildings must be thermally comfortable, buildings must be shielded from heat in our context, and then certain um, lessons learned from physics in simple terms, like draining heat gain to water, which has been seen in our forts and um, traditional buildings, uh, passive techniques, um, looking at emissivity and materiality, where lime and dolomite plasters actually deflect heat from buildings into the infrared region and hence make the surface temperatures cool. All of these understandings have been drawn and borrowed from our experiences of you know, talking to people, engineers, um, mechanical engineers, craftspeople, and trying to sort of enrich and uh, create a toolkit of how we can continue to work and find new meaning. <coughs> the other set of uh, important components for us are the technical anchors. Structural systems and economies is a very, very important area of defining how uh, one moves with a certain idea. We found great advantages working with confined masonry construction uh, because of the work we've done in Kutch in zone five. Um, also believe that water centric and thermal comfort design approaches really create a, a, a very interesting set of tools to work with along with lime. And all of this at the end of the day makes it labor intensive and benefiting a lot more people. So um, this is basically the set of tools with which we uh, try and tune ourselves with what we want to do um, with a certain respect towards um, the human condition as well as the human as a component of nature. I'd like to uh, begin with the Ajrak studio, which was uh, a small uh, studio for Ismail Bhai Katri, who is a master craftsman of Ajrak craft, right next to the LLDC uh, project that we did in 2016. Um, sorry, there is a slight misplacement of the slide. I would like to uh, show you one small um, Yeah, so um, let's begin with this one. Uh, this is a small house we did in Adipur recently, just before the, handed over before the lockdown. Uh, it's a house for a joint family um, in Adipur and right in the middle of a very dense urban plotted uh, system of dwellings. And these are some of our studies and discussions and uh, ideas of the project. And here is the plan. 
So this is uh, a building in confined masonry, um, all brick, lime, so keep bricks, lime mortar, lime plaster, and embodies everything that I've talked about so far in its making and its uh, ability to become thermally comfortable. The most important part of this project, which I would like to touch upon briefly, is that we realized how important it is to listen keenly to clients to build a rapport in order to realize an objective that is so complex in a fair and condensed and considered manner. It is important for us to establish a dialogue with the stakeholders to raise new questions and opportunities to enrich and clarify programs. These slides are exactly the kind of models and discussions that we had with the clients in a participatory inclusive process of interaction irrespective of the scale of the project. So here we are with the family discussing their home and what amazed us was that every site meeting were, had full participation from the family. Um, every aspect of the house is discussed and gone over and it was an amazing experience for us to reach out and for them to reach out to our ideas and how those have been um, sort of incorporated within the house. And then when the project gets done, it sits like this in the middle of Adipur town with a satiated sort of a process between us and the family whom we were working for. That's the finished product. And a very simple home, which was owned up and occupied within 24 hours of uh, them moving in. And this to us is a very, very gratifying and uh, enriching experience. One of the things that we found here in this was their willingness to reach out to furniture and elements that have gone out of their homes in to, replace, to be replaced by modern furniture and sofas and those kind of things. And here we were able to pick all of these uh, elements from uh, warehouses which sell old furniture and reinstate that back into uh, sort of a new connect with this family. So that's how the house looks when completed. Um, and what was amazing was that the clients wanted everything that we talk about from radiant cooling to lime to uh, sensitively planted outdoors, um, managing every drop of water that comes out of the house. And so we were just delighted that in such a small uh, home for this family, we were able to uh, deliver and really take care of every aspect that would you know, be embodied in a large project. And for us, this is a very important project because it has reinforced our belief that your, it's, it's up to you and your ability to reach out to um, make uh, a difference to people's lives through what you know. The plan that you see here is Ajrak and um, Ajrak Studio, which is, um, I'll just go back to the site plan. Yeah, so that's Ajrak Studio, which sits right outside of uh, Ajrakpur, uh, next to the LLDC in Ajrakpur village in Kutch. And this is for Ismail Bhai Khatri, who is a master craftsman. So this basically uh, was an adjacent plot um, next to his house. And what it contains are two components. One is the uh, workshop for Ajra printing, along with a little retail outlet where their products can be sold. And it's a very small building, but again, like the previous one, uh, this called for a new way of putting across our principles of thermal comfort uh, using the program as a device to find meaning 
to create shade and uh, ventilation and a sense of place. So in this, we have the shop, the main space where people are entertained and oriented to the craft of Ajrak printing, the courtyard where work happens along with the indigo vat in the middle. And to the right here is the printing shed. Special porosity, cross ventilation, using storage to insulate on the heat gain sides, using the lifted roof and an operable sort of a system that controls the amount of um, breeze that enters and leaves. All of these um, ideas turn this into a very adjustable, manipulatable device as a building and something that becomes very, very flexible for them to use. Again, in this project, we used uh, locally made fly ash bricks along with lime mortar and plaster. And the yellow pigment that you find is a, is a mineral pigment found in a quarry nearby in Khauda, which actually has a fantastic chemistry with lime and becomes integral to lime plaster. So these are all uh, materials that have been you know, locally sourced. And that's how this building sits in the context of the village. And way beyond, you see glimpses of the LLDC uh, project. And just to give you a sense of what this building is, I'd turn on a few videos for you to look at. That's the uh, inner courtyard with the washing uh, zone, the place where various kinds of wet processes happen, the chula where uh, the fabric is boiled and processed. And that's the indigo vat, which actually is buried below ground to maintain a thermal, uh, thermally stable environment for the indigo to ferment with these four outlets, which actually have hot charcoal thrown into them to maintain the temperature. It's uh, very interesting to see um, the inner space as something that unifies the port, the shop, and the place where Ismail Bhai interacts with the people. That's the small retail space from where they display and sell their wares. And all of the wood here is recycled wood from old uh, timber logs found uh, nearby. And the louvers actually make this uh, building very breathable and low maintenance. And that's the kind of sense So again, in this project, the furniture was all picked up from old warehouses, repaired and used. Nothing new was made here. And uh, it was, it's a very simple place for this great master craftsman to thrive and work with his craft.
this is the second wing across the court, which is the printing shed and is used for demonstrations. Uh, he also works here in his personal space. And there are also groups of tourists who come and see the craft uh, being practiced. Um, one of the important aspects in this project was also uh, that the clients have this amazing knowledge of the chemistry of materials which they use in their craft. And lime and indigo are also one of the uh, materials that are used in the craft. And so our discussions with them about using lime and indigo together when the dolomite plaster was being done was very, very exciting because uh, here to the left, we have Sufyan, his son. This is Ismail Bhai and his Karigar. And we are trying to work with the lime craftsman. So in this, uh, we tried to sort of create a library of his blocks, which get embedded in the line as we work. It was not very perfect, but he was quite happy with the idea that something like this uh, is possible. And so here we are trying to make a visual library of his blocks as a reference in the print shed, uh, which he can explain to visitors and students of textile design and other people who come into this workshop to work with him. So for us, this was a very exciting uh, sort of a phase in the project, uh, where imperfections are also more important sometimes than the possibility of doing something interesting. Right next door is the Living and Learning Design Center, which we built uh, several years back, almost was handed over in 2016. And they hold something known as the LLDC or the Living and Learning Design Center Folk Festival every January. In fact, the festival is on this year online. But last year, there was a, there was a mega, major event planned where lots of craft people and musicians would come and occupy the central court of the building. And um, it was a six day event, which saw a lot of fanfare. There were about 5,000 people landing up every day over a span of 24 hours, visiting, eating and leaving, and they needed services. So um, we were called in to do the master plan for the event which included working with the Mandap contractor to make layouts, to design uh, spaces that went in and out of the building project, and also to provide services. So this is the central courtyard where we were asked to make layouts for the, um, the stalls and how, uh, where crafts people would be seated and where would they sell their stuff and things like that. And along with that, we were also asked to detail out a small toilet block in a corner of the plot, which was basically a Khajuri plantation. And so this was the sort of idea of using, and this, was, this toilet block was supposed to be built very cheaply. They had no resources and it had to be done in about three weeks uh, of construction time. And so, we proposed a series of plinths that held the services and then put this uh, <coughs> bamboo cage over those uh, over that service block to become make the shelter so this is the uh, idea it's a very simple plan you have two entries and a simple open space an external skin of bamboo that wraps around and inner uh, stalls were made out of waste wood and shareboard partitions. So this is how the toilet block sits. That is the living and learning design center. And we are in the service end uh, right next to the DWATS system. So this is the way the toilet block was made. And the most incredible thing that we used um, almost out of uh, a sort of, um, uh, it was not planned to be such. 
we harvested the khajuri leaves and used them as a screen in this project so here you are the khajuris which were uh, sort of in the way were cleared and inserted as screen material into this and this was a quickly put together structure um, with very basic ties and components and sufficed for the event and what was interesting is that the the khajuri leaves or the date palm leaves would dry out and gaps would be formed and you could always harvest new uh, leaves and insert them within the binding of the coir rope so this was a very simple exercise we did and quite uh, happy with the way it turned out well ventilated uh, low on resources easy and quick to put together and uh, it's something that can be repaired and sustained over a period of time without much cost the last project which i would like to uh, share today is the natrani amphitheater project which talks about um, uh, the existing the existing darpana academy for performing arts the natrani theater within and this whole ensemble of modernist buildings from kanvinde to a small library by doshi and kirti shah's earlier version of uh, natrani theater and this whole history of what existed so you had the library in, in 63 a small temple added in 66 uh, kanvinde's academy dance academy in 68 natani theater redone in 94 the cafe in 99 and in 2017 the riverfront edge reinforced by two galleries one for dr vikram sarabhai and the other for rinalini sarabhai designed by hcp and a wall that was built as an acoustical wall by abikram in this uh, line of events we were asked in 2017 and 18 to redo the natrani theater with an improved capacity and uh, state of the art lighting and sound and um, solutions uh, that would take care of thermal comfort water and the like so here we are Uh, this slide is uh, shows what abikram was attempting with various uh, wall uh, walling systems to create an acoustic wall and this was a very early photograph when we were not uh, uh, engaged as architects this was much earlier and then you see this wall and this profile which is the library by doshi built in 63 and all of this was part of the old ensemble of natrani theater and a lot of the wall the a lot of the theater was lost to the riverfront in the front which had actually made this um, theater unusable and so the clients uh, laid out a plan for enhanced capacity they were also not in a position to use the uh, the library building because it was in a state of great disrepair and also unsafe with the roof almost crashing in and here we are with the clients <clears throat> in a process of demolition reconstruction trying to figure out how the new will appear out of the old and i think here one of the decisions that the clients also supported was every piece of debris every piece of so soil sand and material that came out of the old was recycled reused in the foundations reused in the making of new surki bricks and reappropriated into the new project we also proposed that since we have tiered seating and a stage that we should have a massive underground tank below the stage which will become a resource with water rain water which can be used to cool the structure so that's where our understanding of structure cooling and uh, creating a thermally comfortable environment for the patrons who would be sitting in this open air theater started to evolve so what you see here are the uh, photographs of excavation and then the making of the tank its early uh, patterns of how the brick is laid out 
and then the making of the tank. So this may, uh, this tank had a capacity of a lakh one lakh liters of water. So the um, the th this is the uh, western edge of the site. This is the riverfront. That's the existing wall and the riverfront avenue on the eastern side. And so we had this access from here onto number six, which became a plaza where the library once stood and then the amphitheater itself. One of the challenge here in section also was how does one use the underbelly of the theater? Uh, so, the, so all the services, the mechanical room, the electrical room, the green rooms and toilets all went into the underbelly of the tiered seating while the upper part became free for public use, which is number six here. And um, so you had the main stage and you had the forecourt, the arrival space. And what was interesting here was the manner in which one had to engage with the existing uh, Kanvinde building, its structure. Also, it's an old building, which meant that we had to really tiptoe around that structure and work in a way that would not uh, adversely affect it and also restore the strength at the uh, level below ground. This uh, set of drawings I've included also to uh, show the kind of process that went into the making of this project. So there was the, the earthiness of the tiered seating and there was a requirement for a cantilevered uh, catwalk, which would hover over the um, public arena and provide for sophisticated lighting and sound and projections. So this uh, cable stayed cantilevered catwalk was thought of as something that would be accessible and provide the necessary um, advantage to uh, house the infrastructure. This structure was not sort of thought of as being independent or different from um, the experience of viewing. It was thought of as this invisible canopy that you know goes over your head in the darkness from where uh, one experiences a different kind of scale. So architecturally, it was quite a challenge to incorporate this in the milieu of the existing um, language of exposed brick and concrete and then the detailing that went into it i'll just move a little quickly through this uh, so that's the movement from the the city side of the entrance to the natrani uh, complex and the walkway that leads up to It's buffering, just give me a moment. So I'll go back, yeah. So that's the, the forecourt. Far, at the far end, you see the Kanvinde building, exposed brick and um, exposed concrete frame. And this is the intervention that we sought. So there was the contained space of the amphitheater and the access way down towards the towards the river, which goes past the uh, the acoustic wall. So this is where the negotiation between what Kanvinde's building stood right there with the dance floor, and it used to be addressing the river at one point in time, and then we come in and open up. Uh, this and cup the space so that it defines its own uh, 
it, de it defines its own. So to us, uh, while we work with certain architectural uh, principles of articulation, porosity, um, negotiation between new and old and uh, the like, I think the whole um, underpinning of all of this seems to have been the need to create something which is which has its own identity at the same time comfortable. So this is the inner realm of the theater. And what is very interesting in this is that um, the seating actually incorporates radiant cooling uh, uh, or other structure cooling using the stored rainwater in the underground tank. And there are also uh, diffusers that allow fresh air to move through and displace the stale air during a performance. So I think that uh, was also sort of a very interesting marriage between what the section was doing and what the uh, concerns for comfort in such a space should be. And the transformation of the space between day and night is quite dramatic. Um, the catwalk kind of is there for some time and then would vanish. Um, what was interesting also was uh, the challenge of incorporating the, uh, the identity of the steel structure in the presence of what already existed. And I think that was one of the most challenging and exciting part for us on the project. So this is the accessible catwalk, which actually we engaged the existing acoustic wall to become a sort of a receiver so that you could almost go up to the wall and start lighting up the place from various uh, points above. And this is now used in very, very multidimensional ways by artists who perform um, uh, various kinds of contemporary forms of dance. And what uh, we see uh, looking back at our own work is a struggle to sort of uh, be sensible and appropriate, try and stretch ourselves to um, you know, minimize uh, our sort of um, ability to um, dis disrupt land, disrupt landscape. But again, begin to create processes that start to occupy and re, sort of reheal things. So this is a challenge which we are sort of, I think we all face. Give me a moment. I think the net is a little slow. The slides got a little mixed up. Um, so this is the whole idea of how materials articulate. The diffusers from where fresh air moves into the space. The coming together of various components. To the right is the theater. Uh, this um, little access down to the river was worked out so that we could access the Mridanari Sarabhai Gallery. And we also created some toilets for the theater right underneath here. So uh, in a way, the de development and the evolution of the program uh, was a continuously evolving one and also highly circumstantial. <clears throat> we proposed that these steps would be in a certain way. But when we started excavating, we found that the neem tree had its roots all over the place. And so the adjustments done to the profile of the steps and the curved wall and all of those uh, had to be shaped depending on what was discovered as the excavation goes on. And I think 
these are these are things that we um, sort of find very challenging, but at the same time very rewarding to have been able to sort of you know work around it and preserve it. Place and character amidst all of this is another vital thing that we need to sort of work with. And I think if the underpinnings are in the right place, um, you are able to sort of achieve maybe 50% of what you set out to do. The, this is the uh, photograph of the green rooms below the, um, uh, the tiered seating, which now display all the uh, posters that were made throughout the career of Minalani Sarabhai. And it's a sort of a little gallery that inspires artists to be part of. So this is a very um, interesting place. And that's what the, the artists transform the space into. I mean, there, is, uh, there are so many interesting surfaces that during performances, um, multiple projections and other things really transform the architecture and uh, turn it into something that we had not imagined uh, beyond a point as we went about this project. But I think this is one of the most important uh, aspects of how this place uh, has a life during the day and life at night. And then when there is nothing, it's placid and it addresses the river beyond and the promise of one day being able to go across to the river from here. I would like to end with a small slide, which I find very interesting and connects us back to the theme of this uh, series, which is uh, questioning how in tune with nature are we. And this lady is Champaben Banani. She is a applique work artist, uh, artisan from uh, Sumrasar in Kutch. And I bumped into her and saw this lovely piece made by her and asked her if she could describe what it is. And here she is for you all. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Oda. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, astute eye to detail, and how do you integrate uh, everything else together to come to you know as as a piece of art and as a piece of poetry. Um, we have our provost, uh, Professor Dilai Yajnik. Pratish, would you want to please introduce him? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Yajnik, for joining in. This is Uday Andhare, Hi, architect from SEPT, and uh, uh, that's Professor Yajnik here. Oh. Just thought you could say hi to each other. Professor Thank Yajnik. you. Thank you for joining us, uh, Mr. Uday. Thank you so much for talking to uh, our faculty, students. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I found it very interesting connecting nature with uh, architecture. I'm That's just a little I'm... curious, uh, just a little curious if I may ask. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned about your home that you have designed yes. in uh, uh, outskirts of Ahmedabad. Yes. Very, uh, uh, you know, it's so close to nature. There are so many elements which are so close to nature and very nice, uh, interesting design. Uh, may I ask uh, which locality, which area is this? 
this is uh, western the new west zone of Ahmedabad, which Bhopal. is uh, it's no. a little north of Gopal. Okay. Uh, so it is uh, if you draw a straight line from Thaltech towards west, that's the line we are on. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. It's about ten kilometers from Thaltech. I see. Huh? We are quite green. The whole area. <laughs> So, uh, Uday, uh, yeah. thanks for this uh, wonderful, wonderful, inspiring presentation. And I would use the word inspiring because I think it's a wonderful lesson for students and for any professionals about uh, a kind of a very deep uh, commitment, passion, a very deep thought and a very uh, a kind of a systematic query and a stable language for that query. And I think uh, one can see that stability or sincerity in all your thoughts, your ideological moorings, your referencing, and also in the final you know, outcome. So I think it's, it's, such, it's very, very nice to, for all of us to see your work, not only students. So thanks for that. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Uh, you know, I, I had a comment and it's more of a comment rather than a question. Maybe you can add on to that discussion. And uh, I mean, in some sense, we all come from a modern training. You know, our training, uh, ideas of our training, or also uh, comes is a lineage out of modern architecture. And definitely, at SEP, we were made to not only look at the outcome, but also the process. And that process becomes a way to ask meaningful questions. But my question is really about, you know, when you develop a building, especially my question is related with aesthetics of the building. Since your concerns are so, uh, uh, so fresh sometimes, uh, in the 1950s, nobody was talking about nature or lime or, you know, or indigo in the manner in which you are talking about it. Post 90s generation started talking about it. How do you kind of marry this training of uh, that comes from modernity in some sense and also our ideas of aesthetics because I notice your aesthetics you don't talk about it and I, and I and I kind of was intrigued why you don't talk more about it comes from a certain kind of a lineage of modern architecture also while your concerns seems to be really coming from your ideas of environment ecology nature and culture and uh, it would be nice if you can share this uh, kind, and it is a, and it is not easy because, um, you know, I'm sure there is a kind of a struggle. Or would you like to talk more about it? Yeah. It. Uh, so uh, it has been a struggle. Um, mm -hmm. Also, um, I mean, some of the um, grounding that you received as a student, okay, is very difficult to shake off. Yeah. <laughs> you can kind of are in love with certain scales, certain right. uh, ways that you would manipulate space. And also recalling uh, early modernist works and uh, trying to see value in how space was definitely handled. And uh, when it comes to suddenly working with lime, which is a more uh, plastic uh, surface medium, compared to say exposed brick or uh, exposed concrete or plastered concrete. Um, load bearing line will afford more flexibility. Right. The moment you come out of the moorings of the, uh, the, the, the entrapment of a trabeated system. Yeah. And so the struggle is to, I mean, we are still in the middle of this, your question kind of, uh, catches me in the middle of that struggle to free yourself from the clutch of the rectilinearity of a, of a gesture and embrace something which is far more organic and fluid yeah. because of the way the material can allow you to do certain things. But there are, so, so between programmatic diktats, site, uh, um, available uh, methods of construction, economies of construction today, the middle ground is what you see right now. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not easy to, uh, for us to kind of uh, 
pin the aesthetic down that uh, and also there is a certain circumstantial um, impact on the aesthetic choices that one would make correct uh, they would also come uh, you, you know working in distant areas of kutch uh, has also taught us that you, your detailing has to be something that can be prefabricated and assembled on site so in the last house that we did uh, the awnings in metal the trellis structure its metal work all of those things got fabricated in andabad and were loaded on to these empty trucks which are returning after dumping lignite in andabad and uh, yeah. you use those kind of so um, there are those considerations that engage yeah. us or compel us to work in a certain way yeah. and of course the 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 yeah. aesthetic uh, actually evolves and that's what i mentioned in in the talk also that uh, expression is something which is dictated by the underpinning or the concern that one has and it is not something that is our own it will yeah. emerge and that's the way we uh, have ended up working so far yeah yeah but I mean, it, it is a very conscious uh, it's we are conscious of the fact and at the same time free that we allow ourselves to sort of um um be taken over sometimes by yeah. the circumstantial dictates yeah. in in fact oday i mean i'm pretty excited about that part and i would really i have been following your work i've been seeing your work for a long time we have also had occasions to discuss other things in juries and all but i think you know this possibility of a free aesthetic which you really don't know what will come and it will be dictated by the circumstances is a very interesting possibility in your work and i i i feel that uh, I, i as you said it is still kind of work in progress and it would be very fascinating to my mind i'm fascinated by that question as to what kind of aesthetics that does not refer to the modernist training i mean it i mean we are all the lineage is always remains the same i think is a very very fascinating question for me to kind of pursue and see where your work goes and i think that's a question that maybe other students would also like to keep in mind but but thanks for this really 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 interesting Yeah, any of our faculties have any questions uh, please feel free to unmute and ask i guess everybody is just spellbound and uh, or struck i guess uh there i had one question for you a uh, comment and a question one is i like the way that you know you uh, it's simple in design it's simple uh, in experience but uh, sorry it's rich in experience and it's simple in design and that is a richness that adds to the flavor of the space the quality of space uh, in your uh, house you had a lot of openness you know so being in an urban area uh, this is a very practical question and uh, you know uh, all of us urbanites don't like the uh, insects coming in the mosquitoes coming in so how do you uh, is that a problem in your place when you're living because you know that's one thing that clients would ask for you know that uh, we'll have insects in our in our house and we'll have mosquitoes and we'll have a lot of dust coming in the house so how do you take care of all these uh, you know nitty gritties of uh, real life in your design process I think he is. Did he uh, log off by mistake or something? I think there was a power cut. Power cut and uh, yeah. I'll just call him. Just a minute. Ah, uh, he's not there. Maybe Shantanu can answer that question. If <laughs> not really, Neha, yeah, that that's kind of a trick question. Uh, <laughs> it's a interesting question to ask though but the question really is that it's when the architect is building for themselves they they can bear with snakes and uh, <laughs> uh, anything in the name of design but the problem is when we do for other clients and we are asked to put mosquito nets everywhere exactly <laughs> so 
let's see if he I got a message from him there was there has been a power outage and he is reconnecting in a moment okay we can so wait I, for him yeah, yeah we'll wait so a like, minute or two yes so like uh, the our studio that we have neha yeah it is made up of stone masonry so we get snakes and we have lizards inside the stone masonry but we are pretty tolerant uh, for the for the sake of greater good right <laughs> as they say for the queen kind of a thing <laughs> but uh, i can't give exactly the same structure to my clients i'll have to tone down the stone masonry make it more more practical etc yeah so my house in at harini is brick and lime again and i okay, have snakes okay. and mongooses also i have mongooses who come inside and they play and they go away but you are a nature activist you have to have them <laughs> you can yeah, take but, a selfie with them and put it on but my family Instagram. is not <laughs> so i have uh, for me my husband was my client and it was quite tough actually so when you have mangoes and snakes in the house then you know the okay, family so yeah, goes all great to it's great to have you here in these uh, very architectural forums i am really glad that you are joining us and it's i mean you are, i mean you the discipline you come from and the way you are transcending the boundaries it's it's quite awesome to see you <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah i mean it's interesting you know yeah and i like this um, in tune with nature the theme itself yeah Yeah. So uh, there's so much to learn. I guess that's the best part of being um, in Navarachna University, with so yeah. many schools across, so many different subjects. It's good to learn yeah. something beyond yeah. your field. Yeah, very true. I'm enjoying myself. I'm, you know, I I try and attend <laughs> as many as I can. <laughs> that's really super energy. I think that's really yeah. nice. And I think you know a lot of these works are able to connect. many disciplines like the way uday is talking about culture ecology yeah crafts yeah so i think architects naturally are interdisciplinary correct correct and they're very training yeah i wish somebody from new seri had uh, joined today the uh, for new seri okay environment and research correct I, sorry sorry, sorry i the perils uh, of living on the outskirts of the city <laughs> <laughs> Ode and Neha asked a question to you, and I think all of us answered it since you were absent. <laughs> Neha, do you want to come again on that question? So, um, yeah, Ode, I had a question that you know whether it is your house or the Ajrak Studio, which is you know uh, quite open and it has this uh, connect with nature where you use uh, uh, creepers as screens. Uh, what happens when you have a lot of insects and mosquitoes, especially the monsoons, and how do you deal with the dust uh, aspect through design in the summers? So the the creepers manage the dust because uh, the creepers actually take the brunt of the dust, mm -hmm. and behind the creepers are these doors with fly mesh. Those okay. manage the mosquitoes, and you kind of um, uh, discover how to use your house over a period of time. you know when the mosquitoes would enter <laughs> you know when uh, it is safe to do what so i think there is a uh, these kind of environments call for a deeper engagement with your building and almost a device which you learn to operate over time and i think uh, it makes that engagement so much more enriching than say a smart home <laughs> you know so i think that's where we come from on this yeah thank you uh there's one question from rutvik javia uh, sir you have used many passive techniques in your projects can you just tell us the importance of passive technique with this modern architecture so uh one is that they 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 are as passive as possible uh, we can't be entirely passive and uh, what uh, we've discovered over time is the advantage of the thermal flywheel which means that if you create an environment which uh, is a good defense uh, uh, for summer and we generally in, in the tropics design for summer and ventilation in humid conditions we don't have to worry too much about the uh, the winter so if you are designing for the summer you create a place which actually has a defense against the heat entering the inside of the building and that basically 
rolls into winter actually charging the building up and making it cool to face the summer so there is this um, relay of temperature which is called the uh, thermal flywheel which actually becomes the tool and then with a little bit of mechanized um, um, thermal draining or using uh, you know stored rain water in your slabs to keep circulating so that you don't let the roof temperature go beyond 33 degrees these are the little uh, things that you can add on to the, to an already fortified structure to become comfortable as a living space but i think what is fundamental is um, the manner in which the architecture is conceived so that it can become uh, it can receive all of these other embellishments to stay um, comfortable so i neha i have a small question yeah, yeah. sure okay. uh, so thank you for a wonderful uh, lecture uh, ma'am the presentation by you i think i really enjoyed it and it uh, does raise a lot of questions so this is in connection with uh, what uh, neha just uh, asked uh, but it is the other side of it uh, i mean if we look at these traditional uh, uh, societies they have been you know really living with nature uh, since a long time uh, and i think as we are getting more and more urbanized uh, we come across a lot of people who and, and i think i think many people who are who feel absolutely disconnected with nature uh, i'm not saying i mean they they do miss nature yeah. but they don't want to you know accept nature or embrace nature uh, because there there are flip sides of it i mean for example a friend was one telling me that when insects or ants would come in their house the grandmother would say oh they have the equal right to live as uh, you do Uh, but that's not the way we we have learned to live in today's time period so what have been your uh, experiences especially as an architect who is i mean because you might you would be doing even projects for the clients who are very much there in urban centers uh, and i think i mean uh, do you think it there's a cultural change that we need as to how we look at it and how do we relate to nature yes very much um i think a lot of people uh, through the visual exposure to what great living is thanks to uh, all the advertisements by developers to begin with and everything that you see in media today points towards a very um, elitist uh, secluded and sanitized environment as being the way of the future and uh, the pandemic has thrown light on exactly the opposite of this that one needs to have offices that can be opened out one needs to have buildings that can breathe one needs to have walls that can share um, uh, and breathe across and also in homes um, you have to have that little piece of garden even if you are on the 10th floor and by that i would mean a small pot in which you have say a barmasi growing and i think that realization has yeah. happened uh, a lot of people and that's why you see this tremendous exodus right now of uh, people wanting to buy land outside of the city centers and i'm sure baroda is visit, experiencing the same thing as amdavad or other cities and there are there's a escalation of land value all across the perimeter of cities simply because people think that they need to go out but the sad part is that they would go out and ask for the same thing that they are used to and disconnect themselves from the happenings around them and i think um uh, it is just uh, is the way we are i think as a society but there are people who are you know realizing this and trying to embrace in small ways they are skeptical about insects and creepy crawlies and other things and i keep emphasizing to them that there is a detail for everything i mean you make a fly mesh and then you have these bristles underneath the door which make sure that the um in monsoon the earthworms don't crawl into your drawing room or scorpions don't come in and there are details for things 
And I think as a fraternity, we, we owe it to people to elevate their fears about what are the possibilities that still allow them to stay connected with nature and how architecture and design plays a role in creating that meaningful interface. So uh, I think that's where our efforts need to be focused. Uh, Mr. Uday, uh, lovely presentation. So nice to see people in so in, so much in touch with our techniques, traditional techniques and all this. And it's interesting to note that you're interested in biodiversity. And in today's world, we are only talking about selective biodiversity. I like this biodiversity. I don't like that diverse biodiversity. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. it's very nice that you're dealing with a kind of an open house, like, hey, I live with nature. Very, very, very nice. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, I have one more technical question. Uh, the form of your water tanks that you have shown uh, is very unique and different than what you see traditional water tanks as being, you know, being built nowadays. So any specific reason for that particular form? Or is it based on material uh, and construction? Yeah. So um, uh, this is basically, uh, this comes from how uh, a water tank basically needs to be an element in compression. And so these are uh, crucibles at the bottom and the cylindrical shaft and a dome on top. So mm -hmm. it becomes this capsule, which is embedded in the ground and has equal thrust from all sides and about uh, the, the amount of earth on top is about three feet. So what happens is this structure remains in compression and as a result of which water doesn't leak out. And then when you have lime uh, mortar, lime plaster and uh, those kind of uh, water impregnable uh, coatings from inside, then you get a tank which is very economical to build and uh, can sustain for a long time below ground. Also, it's made out of earth, which is, you know, brick. And so uh, structurally, it's the most sort of stable diagram uh, or a stable volume that one can insert into the ground. It's also easy to construct uh, with virtually no reinforcement. And this is a method which is being practiced in Saurashtra for like centuries and used in farmlands to make these little modules and also to make uh, biogas uh, units using masonry. So we just took that idea and engineered it so that when we work in zone five, we take care of lateral forces, we do ties and reinforcement and those kind of things and uh, uh, make it adaptable to a slightly different uh, seismic condition. So it's just as simple as that. Thank you. It's good to see, you know, that kind of an understanding find its way into architectural drawings. And that's why I, I asked. Thank you so much. Yeah, and they, they, they make for very good looking sections. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we were suspecting all this while. I think it's the visuality of the section that seduced to into that form. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think uh, we've reached the end of our session today, and I there are no more questions. Uh, so I'm I just going like to, move to thank. Into a little bit of light. Yeah. Oh, it's I'm come. Just to light. Yeah. yeah. So I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Uday Andhare for his wonderful insight. Thanks, Uday, so much for sharing you. your uh, your knowledge and experience with us, and look forward to having more interactions. Yeah, I'm really sorry that my discussion with Pratyush got truncated badly. I mean, we were heading for something very interesting, but we'll catch up on that Pratyush and- uh, Absolutely, Uday. absolutely. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, invite you here for, to begin with for some juries. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks a lot, Uday. Welcome, thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Bye.